Praise the Lord, and welcome to Peter's Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. Our scripture for the morning is taken from the second chapter of Lamentations, verse 20, reading from the New Revised Standard Version updated edition, and it reads, Look, Lord, and consider to whom have you done this? Should women eat their offspring, the children they have born? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? I want to preach from the title, Witnesses Get Stitches. Witnesses Get Stitches. Sometimes in life, good people must change their position in order to have victory. Sometimes good people must reposition their outlook on life in order to overcome life's obstacles. I have now lived long enough that I have concluded that success in life comes down to three R's. Relationships, reflection, and readjustment. Relationships. We have to be around the right people. Reflection, we have to be willing to rethink things and think back on things deeply and to think about the right things. And then readjustment, our ability and willingness to adapt to life when things don't go our way. More times than not, just because we make plans, it is as if life waits until we make a plan in order to mess up our plan. And so in order to get something done, we must be able and willing to readjust when things don't go our way. I believe those three R's will ultimately lead to one final R, results. In order to get results, it takes relationships, reflection, and readjustment. The Book of Lamentations gives us an up-close, personal, and even terrifying look and what happens when good people are not willing to stand up to the bad things that they see happening around them. It's a terrifying snapshot of what happens when good people who know better allow evil people to have their way. The sinners of Jerusalem had transformed the obedient inhabitants of the city into collateral damage. Jeremiah says, look, O Lord, and consider, to whom have you done this? Should women eat their offspring? The children they have born, should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? The Babylonians had surrounded Jerusalem after destroying the walls surrounding the city. And due to their hunger, mothers were so desperate that children became the meals that people ate. All of this started because God warned them not to break the first commandment, which was, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no gods before me. And over time, the people of Jerusalem built idol after idol, and it began incrementally. As they say, the devil doesn't work instantly. He works incrementally. It was one idol, then two idols, then one temple went up to another God, then two temples, and before you know it, one would look at Jerusalem and have no idea that the God of Israel was even worshiped in the city. And the handful of good people who saw this happening did nothing and said nothing. And when the prophets spoke out against the evil, other people in Jerusalem would stone them, and the good people who saw it said nothing and did nothing. The witnesses to this, the good people, ended up getting the stitches because the good people of Jerusalem should have separated themselves from that evil. They should have spoken out, and if the people did not change, they should have separated themselves from the evil. So often the reason that good people will not separate themselves from evil things, whether in a family, a neighborhood, or a community, is because good people always hold out hope that evil people will change. And they hold out hope with misplaced loyalties that maybe one day 
they'll change. Because it's so heartbreaking to realize some people have made up their mind. They will be what they're going to be. They're going to do what they're going to do. But in this case, the good people of Jerusalem held out hope that maybe the sinners will repent. Maybe they'll turn back to the Lord. But alas, we find in Lamentations, this was not the case. In actuality, when good people move on from those doing evil, it is the best thing for those doing evil because it forces them to have to do one of two things, to change or to live with the consequences of what they've been doing. Parents who love their children should help them out, but if they keep bailing them out and never let the children face the consequences of what they're doing, ultimately it hurts the children. I remember telling Alexandria one day to stop playing around in her chair or she would fall. And I did not want her to fall, but she kept playing. And before I could tell her, because I hate to spank her, but I was just about to tell her, if you don't stop playing in that chair, you know I don't like spanking you, but daddy's going to spank you. No sooner than I said that did she start falling, and I caught her a little bit. So she didn't catch the full impact of the floor. As we know, the floor and the ground never lost a fight. But I could tell by the look on her face, I did not have to tell her not to play anymore. She remembered. I saw the look, that look of, oh, life is real. If you keep playing, life is real. And when she hit that floor, I picked her up and I held her. But I said, do you see what happens? Do you see what happens when you don't listen? And then I let her know, daddy loves you. And I said, and the Lord helped me out. The Lord went ahead and did the spanking so I didn't have to. But, but, but life has a way of teaching us a lesson that many times good people don't want to see that happen to other people. But ultimately, the hardest decision is to say, I'm going to have to step aside and let life do what it does. And then at that point, that person will have to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to change. Jerusalem was supposed to be an environment for worshipers. And it had become an environment for foolishness. And foolishness had taken over the city. And there is less food on the table when there's foolishness on the mind. There's more danger in the streets when there's foolishness on the heart. It is a hard way to live life, living around foolishness. And Jerusalem had become an environment for foolishness. In a bad environment, the good people, the witnesses of the Lord, will get stitches. In this case, those who witnessed before the Lord were being stoned even before they were being killed by the Babylonians. And let us never forget, we remember back in 2 Kings chapter 20, Hezekiah, 100 years before Lamentations was written, 100 years before this, Hezekiah welcomed the Babylonians into his home, into his palace, into the city. And the prophet Isaiah warned him not to do that and said, the grandchildren of these men will return one day and will take everything from your descendants. Hezekiah, being a good person, could not see the Babylonians were trifling. The Babylonians would have a smile on their face, but would have their fingers crossed and a knife behind their back, ready to put that knife in somebody else's back. Hezekiah could not see what the good people of Jerusalem and Lamentations could not see, that only God can change the heart and only God can overcome a bad environment. I normally don't do three points in a sermon, but I'm going to make an exception after 22 years of preaching because this text demands that I'm going to give three points, then I'm going to sit down. The first point is this, environments determine strength. We can be no stronger than our environment allows us to be. Churches give strength. That's why churches are essential. That's why churches will always endure because churches give strength. People feel better after the benediction. Even when, 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 when we were younger and didn't want to go to church, we didn't quite know what church was doing to us. But even when we were younger and we had to be dragged to church, church was putting something in us that we would use later in life because we learned how to pray. We learned how to call on the name of the Lord when times were hard because church is an environment that does that. But there are other environments that are not conducive to what saints need. Environments give strength. I'll put it to you this way. The great white shark is one of the most dangerous animals in all of the earth. The great white shark is a bad something. It's a bad man. You do not want to see a shark, but especially a great white shark. But take that shark out of the Atlantic Ocean and drop it in an African safari. And let's see how bad it will be. That shark will become a sardine if you drop it in the jungle. But that shark will become cat food because a lion will come around and we'll see how bad that shark is because the shark is no longer in an environment that makes it strong. 
All of a sudden, that shark becomes flipper when you put him in the jungle. At the same time, take that lion and drop him in the ocean. And that lion will become fish food. The king of the jungle will become Morris the cat when you drop him in the ocean around some sharks because now that lion is in an environment that is not conducive to what the lion does. Our environment gives us strength. I was blessed just a little while ago, a few weeks ago. I had not been to what I, I call the capital of the world and some people argue over that, but some scholars argue the capital of the world is New York City. And, and people in London argue otherwise, but, but I, I'm, I'm gonna make the argument because my, my mom grew up in Marcy Project, so I'm gonna make the argument New York is still the capital of the world. Yeah. But I had an opportunity to spend some time in New York recently. God blessed me with, with family and friends there that I could go see, and I had a chance to go to Harlem. I hadn't been to Harlem in a long time. I hadn't been on, on Lenox Avenue, hadn't been on Malcolm X Boulevard in a while, hadn't been on Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King in a while, and took this time to go to what was called the Schomburg, that important center of black cultural studies, a part of the magnificent New York public library system. And, and I went there and I spent time in an exhibit called Marking Time, curated by Dr. Nicole Fleetwood. It's an exhibit that examines the life of men and women who've been incarcerated. And it shows the paintings that they paint where they dream of being free, the poetry that they write. There's even an exhibit made out of the lunch trays in which they're protesting the type of food that, that they're fed with, that they're not even fed decent enough food to live, that in other words, they're basically forced into a form of enslavement that's not designed as a correctional facility to help them get a job and land on their feet, but instead it's designed to make their lives worse. Pictures of women in their bridal gowns getting married behind bars, waiting for the day in which they can be free. I walked through that, that exhibit, it was hallway after hallway, of seeing these pictures and poems of brothers and sisters who had learned to free their minds even if their bodies were yet still incarcerated. I walked around what was called the Cosmogram, where the great Langston Hughes was laid to rest in an urn shaped like a book. And knowing that on the Cosmogram, Dr. Maya Angelou and Dr. Amiri Baraka had once danced around the Cosmogram where there is the great poem Langston Hughes wrote called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I walked throughout Harlem and went to the Abyssinian Baptist Church, the mother church of all Baptist churches in America, built in 1808 by Ethiopian seafarers with some of the oldest stained glass in all of the United States. A church of which Dr. Gardner C. Taylor said is the single most important church in all of black life in America. I was blessed to be able to, to speak to one of the magnificent deacons of that great church and he told me the Abyssinian is open 16 hours a day, seven days a week, serving the community of Harlem. I went throughout the South Bronx and I saw brothers and sisters who were there in the birthplace of hip hop and saw the church of St. Lucie where people would line up in order to pray and to get holy water and fill up their bottles with holy water, seeing how important the life of the church is. And the most beautiful thing that I heard and saw when I was in Harlem particularly was children playing. The number of children on their bicycles, I missed the sound of that. Growing up in the 80s, we used to see children in neighborhoods and I saw children out playing, playing soccer on their bicycles, going to get ice cream. There's something beautiful about the sound of children playing. And what it said to me is that Harlemites were making a statement to the world that this is where we live. This is our community. We make our community a place where our children can play. The environment gives us strength. Me being there for a little while and seeing the city, it, it, it helped me refocus on the work that I must do. Point two is this, the good people, the witnesses, uh, sadly will suffer the most whenever they don't speak up. God has taught us what is right and the difference between right and wrong. And the last thing any of us want to do is leave this world without saying the difference between right and wrong. Witnesses have power. The Lord's witnesses in this world have power. Just the power of saying this is right and this is wrong. That's all it takes sometimes, just saying this is right and that is wrong. Finally, point three is this. As we read in this text that Jeremiah is saying, look, O Lord, to whom have you done this? That to whom there implies that the Lord had rejected them. And point three is this. Whenever we change environments, we renew our strength. 
The Lord had rejected all of his people in Jerusalem in order to force them to move to another place. Sometimes it's a spiritual movement. Sometimes it's an intellectual movement. Sometimes it's a psychological movement. Sometimes it's a physical movement. But God wants us to grow. The first thing we see in the first book of the Bible is the fact that God tells Abraham to go somewhere. The people ended up having to go to Babylon, and then Babylon became Persia. Then they went back and rebuilt Jerusalem anew because their strength had been renewed. Sometimes just going somewhere you've never been for five minutes can give you a whole new perspective on everything. Sometimes just taking a different route to work. Sometimes just taking a walk in a different way that you may not have walked before. It's the point at which God shows you something you would not have seen. If you, can't have, if you kept doing the same thing the same way. The foolishness that abounded in Jerusalem was predicated upon the fact that the people had not been changing, that the people were not moving anywhere. And yet we find once people had moved, those priests that Nebuchadnezzar were, was able to kill during this time, there would never be a time where the priests would be that easy to kill again. The priests who were killed by Nebuchadnezzar after the fall of Jerusalem would no longer be easy to kill. The next generations of priests would know how to move and speak out and change their environment. The prophets who got stoned before Babylon destroyed Jerusalem would be hard at a stone after they built the new Jerusalem. The foolishness that abounded in the old Jerusalem would have no place in the new Jerusalem. When we reorient our mind and our heart and change our environment, then God gives us the strength to change any environment. The challenge was put to me that if I'm really educated, at some point it shouldn't be about moving to a nice neighborhood, but if I'm truly educated, I ought to have the strength to transform any neighborhood into a nice neighborhood. If I'm truly educated and just not book smart, instead of going out and getting a good job, I ought to know how to create good jobs for other people so they can take care of their children. If I'm truly educated, at some point I should transition from being a follower to being a leader. And being educated is not all about what happens in the classroom. It's about allowing the Lord to teach us how to lead someone because all of us are leaders. We lead our households. We lead by example. We lead whether we're at sensations of Piggly Wiggly and just going on about our business by the way that we live and say hello. Being nice to someone is a form of leadership in a mean, cold world. Well, what people need more than anything is for somebody just to say hello and to be nice to them. In a mean world, some people just need a hug. In a mean world, some people just need someone to smile and ask, how are you doing? How's your family doing? That's all some people need. It doesn't take a government grant. It doesn't take a whole lot of ingenuity. It doesn't take a PhD in order just to say, hi, how are you? God bless you. Just know that I'm praying for you. That's all that people need in this world. That's how we lead. I'll leave you with this about environments. You know, Superman is not strong on his own. Superman is actually not strong. The reason Superman has strength is because, and I'm going to get comic book nerdy, but the reason Superman is strong is because he's on Earth. If you know the story, you know he's not from Earth. He's from the planet Krypton. He's the last survivor of a distant planet that was destroyed. And on his planet, his planet had a red sun. And a red sun meant the gravitational pull was stronger. He was from 26,000 light years away, numerous galaxies away. And his father, Jorel, and his mother, Laura L, knew that Kalel, that's his birth name, was going to have to get off of that planet because the planet was going to be destroyed. And so they sent him away and wrapped him up in his baby blanket, which later became a Superman suit, all inspired by the story of Moses, by the way. So whenever Superman leaves planet Krypton, he left a solar system with a class M. M3 star, which had a heavy gravitational pull. What this means is we can't jump 10 feet on Earth, but if we go to the moon, we can all jump 10 feet because there's less gravity on the moon than there is on Earth. Well, there's more gravity on Krypton than there was on Earth. So when he got to Earth with a class G2 star, his Kryptonian physiology began to drink in the radiation of that young star. And all that he went through, passing the asteroid fields and the quasars, meant that he ended up in an environment where his strength and proximity 
proximity to the Son gave him strength. In other words, it's not about who he is, it's about where he is in proximity to what gives him strength. By ourselves, a human being can't do much. But if you take a human being and let that person have a relationship with the Lord, put them in a church, get them around the saints, get them around the Holy Spirit, and like Superman who gets close to the S-U-N, you get us close to the S-O-N, that is the Son of God, that we have all types of abilities. Oh, we can do more than be more powerful than a locomotive. We can do more than hop over a building in a single bound. We can be faster than a speeding bullet. We can speak a word into somebody's life so our young people won't be struck down by bullets. That's the power that God gives us. And you know, when I think about for people in the world who may be lost, who are trying to find out how do I change direction? You know, I'm old school, so I remember when travel agents were a thing. And back in the day, you didn't go online and make your own travel plans. You went to a professional who could direct you where to go. They knew north from south and east from west. And well, 2,000 years ago, or 1,700 years after the events of the Book of Lamentations, there came somebody who went out to Jerusalem, and he went up on a cross, and he went to the new Jerusalem, and out on the cross he died, and the GPS of his blood told sinners the difference between north and south and east and west. Jesus went out as the ultimate travel agent to help everyone in the world reorient their environment, reorient their direction, and let them know where to go. And that's why sometimes even though we go through the worst, we go through the worst in order to get God's best. Sometimes we have to struggle, but we struggle before we strive and get what God has for us. Sometimes we got to break down before we break through. Sometimes we got to break up before we break out. Sometimes we got to go through before we get over. Sometimes we got to limp before we leave. Sometimes we got to fall before we fly. But once we do that, then we can be witnesses who don't get stitches. Then we can be witnesses to God's glory. And then we can be witnesses to God's mercy. And then we can be witnesses to God's provision. And then we can be witnesses to how he held us, how he kept us, how he holds us up, how he healed us, how he blessed us, how he watches over us, how he takes care of our family, how he's with us even until the end of this world. And may all of God's people say amen. amen. And amen. Amen. And amen. We open the doors of this great church this morning that if we happen to have in our midst a brother or sister who wishes to reorient, to change his or her life and give his or her life to the Lord Jesus Christ who is the only one, the only one who can save us, the only one who can redeem us, the only one who can change the old life into the new. We extend the invitation this morning that you may come forth as a candidate for baptism, that you may be born anew, that you may come forth on the basis of your Christian experience, that you may come forth by letter and be a part of Peter's Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church, and that together as a church family, we can encourage and lift up one another as we continue to do the work of the Lord. Church family, as we prepare to dismiss, we're looking forward to homecoming, which will be the third Sunday in August. I'm certainly looking forward to, to being here and worshiping and, and just rejoicing that since 1870, the Lord has been with us, continues to be with us, will continue to be with us. And as always, I want to pray that for the rest of this day and for this entire week, that no matter what you're going through, that no matter what you've been through, that you will never forget that God has his hands upon you. And no matter what you are going through, God is going to make all of it work out in your favor. For we know that God does indeed work for the good of those who love him. And so is his children who love him. I want you to know that God's favor is upon you and is upon your household, is upon your family, and that he's keeping his hands upon you. Let us stand to receive the benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. May all of God's blessed people say amen. amen.
Thank you for joining us at Peter's Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. And may the grace and peace of our Lord be with you always.